I love riding my motorcycle. <laughs> we know that. <laughs> Some of you already knew that. The rest of you don't know me at all. <laughs> when I'm on my motorcycle, I must tell you, out on the open road, I feel free. There is a uh, sense of freedom in riding that transcends any other activity, at least for me. And when I feel free, I feel happy. I consider freedom to be an ultimate value. And that is why Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 is a favorite verse of mine. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. We should count it a privilege. We live in a nation which offers a great deal of personal freedoms. That's something that's rather rare in this world, actually, that uh, people have that degree of liberty. Well, living in Southern California years ago, we, we lived near the uh, West Coast. I was called to attend a general conference of the BIC in Hamilton, Ontario. And uh, I arranged things in such a way that I was able to ride my motorcycle across the continent from Southern California to Hamilton, Ontario. And I uh, was accompanied on that trip by my eight-year-old son, Eric. That was his first transcontinental motorcycle trip, not his last one. But uh, we had an awesome time. It's a great way to see the country, to see the world from the seat of a motorcycle and through the eyes of an eight-year-old child. Well, the conference went fine, and when it was over, I arranged to take a little bit of extra time, and so I said to Eric, where would you like to go next? And at that time, the Statue of Liberty had just been refurbished. And he said, I want to go and see the Statue of Liberty. So we rode from Hamilton, Ontario to New York to see the Statue of Liberty. And that was an exciting, exciting time for the two of us to share. I celebrate freedom and liberty, but I also recognize that it can often be abused. With freedom comes responsibility, and liberty must be balanced with accountability. I wish the Statue of Liberty on the west, or pardon me, on the east coast could be balanced by a statue of responsibility on the West Coast. I think, that would, I think that would kind of give us a better perspective. You know, Galatians 5.13 says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The highest expression of freedom is to give loving service to others. In Galatians 5 and verse 14, we read, The entire law is summed up in a single command, Love your neighbor as yourself. Wow. When we lived in Kentucky, we attended a church that was pastored by Dr. Chad Foster. He was a great Bible teacher and especially a teacher of the Torah. And he did a whole series that lasted a year going through the laws of the Torah and showing how all of them were opportunities to show love to other persons, love to our neighbor. Use your freedom to love your neighbor in practical ways. Feel free to use your time, your energy, and your money to love your neighbor. I think of Romans chapter 15, verse 2, which says, Each of us should please our neighbors for their good, to build them up. Galatians 5, 15. And we're going to work through Galatians chapter 5. So if you wish, you may want to turn there in your Bibles. Galatians chapter 5, verse 15 says, If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Now I teach this verse. First of all, because it's in the Bible, and we teach everything that the Bible teaches. But I teach this verse not because we have a problem in this church, but so that we don't have that kind of problem in this church. 
I know that many churches have been destroyed by that kind of biting and uh, negative attitude that we're warned against here. There is a warning in this verse. And I would say to you that warnings are not negative. The negative counterpart of a warning is a threat. But there's a warning here, and it's a warning to churches, and it's a warning to families that our freedom is not to be used to indulge our sinful nature. But we are free to live by the Spirit. Verse 16 says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. As Jesus followers, we have two natures. Every human being has a sinful nature. We're born with a sinful nature because we are descendants of Adam and Eve. But when we are born again by faith in God through His Son, Jesus Christ, we receive a spiritual nature. The Spirit of God lives within us. And that old sinful nature and that new spiritual nature are in conflict. You've experienced this, haven't you? Galatians 5.17 tells us of this conflict. It says, For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other. I uh, reflect on the story of the old trapper who became a believer, and he was explaining his... Uh, his challenges in terms of this conflict. And he said, it's, uh, it's kind, of, kind of like having a couple of dogs inside me. He said, there's the white dog that wants to do good and the black dog that wants to do bad. And he said, they're fighting back and forth all the time. And somebody said, well, which one wins? And he said, well, whichever one I feed the most. <laughs> and uh, so it is. We need to feed our spiritual nature so that it is strong to stand against the flesh, the sinful nature. Galatians 5.17 points out the conflict. And I know that I can identify with that. I assume that perhaps you can as well. I want to do the right thing, but I'm tempted to do the wrong thing. And sometimes the result is that I do not do what it is that I really want to do. I'm kind of like Paul in Romans chapter 7 where he describes that struggle. I do not do what I want to do all the time. There are times that I do what I do not want to do. And when that happens, as soon as I become aware of it, I confess it to my Lord. It's sin to do anything that's contrary to the Spirit. Anything that's contrary to the will of God. So when you realize that you've done that, ask for God's forgiveness. Immediately, He offers it freely. Thank God He gives us a fresh start whenever and as often as we need it. And then, as you confess your sin, breathe in the fullness of His Holy Spirit. It's spiritual breathing. Spiritual breathing is confession of sin and then by faith receiving the filling of His Spirit once again. Galatians 5, 18 <coughs> has this to say to us. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. When I live by the Spirit, God's law is not restricted. Because when I am living by the Spirit, I naturally, or perhaps I should say supernaturally, want to love my neighbor. Now, Galatians Chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, gives us a list. It's not a very pleasant list. It's a list of evil things. The sinful nature acts out in destructive ways. And Paul names many of them. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, 
dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Wow, what a nasty list. Let's take a look at those things. Well, a quick look, because I don't want to look too long at this. What a mess. Sexual immorality. You know, God is not against sex. In fact, God invented sex. But scripture teaches that sexual activity outside of a committed marriage relationship between one man and one woman is wrong. And when people get involved in the wrong use of God's good gift of sex, it causes a lot of pain. Within marriage, sex can and should be a beautiful thing. Outside of it, it produces guilt and ends up by hurting people that we love. And then it warns against impurity. Impurity means anything which makes us unfit to come into the presence of God. Anything that soils our life and makes us spiritually unclean. Debauchery, what does that mean? Basically it's a craving for pleasure above everything else. The Bible warns us against being lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That's a dangerous situation to get into. And then idolatry. Well, if you think of idols in terms of a little image that you set on the shelf, most of you could probably say, oh boy, thank goodness, here's one I don't need to worry about. <laughs> but what is idolatry, really? Idolatry is to place anything or anyone in your life as being more important than God himself. Literally, anything that takes the place of God in your life is an idol to you. Well, here's one for sure you don't need to worry about, right? Witchcraft? Ah, you say, I'm, I'm good on that score. You know, the word that's translated witchcraft literally means the use of drugs. The use of drugs or sorcery, and of course, drugs were often associated with sorcery, and that's how it gets translated. But, wow, is this something that gets abused in our society today? And for sure, there are those who get into sorcery and witchcraft in a literal sense. Hatred, yikes, the opposite of love for neighbor. Hatred, what a terrible emotion and what pain it causes. Discord, what is discord? It's rivalry that results in quarreling. It's okay to compete in a healthy way, right? It's okay to get out there on the, on the football field or the hockey rink and give it all you got. But when rivalries result in discord and quarreling, that's a problem. Jealousy. Jealousy's been called the green-eyed monster. It's a wrong desire for what someone else has. He's got it, but I want it. And if I had a chance, I'd get it. Take it from him. Fits of rage. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Bursts of temper, which flare up and cause us to say and do things that hurt our neighbors and our families. Wow. It's so easy to do. So hard to control. It's a rage. And then it's this selfish ambition. This is talking about the person who wants a position, not in order to serve, but for what he can get out of it. And dissensions. Dissension means to, to stand apart. I don't want anything to do with that person. I don't want to be a part of that group. You know, the church is a band of brothers and sisters. The church ought to be a band of brothers and sisters loving one another. And then it warns us against factions. Well, factions are the result of dissension. Taking sides. And disliking the people on the other side. Envy. What's the difference between jealousy and envy? 
Well, jealousy means I want what you've got. Envy is bitterness of spirit because you've got it. I'm mad because you've got something I don't have. Drunkenness. Drunkenness turns people into beasts. It's a, a case of losing judgment, and especially moral judgment, so that we can't see the difference between right and wrong. And a, lot of, a lot of wrong is done because people get drunk. Orgies, what does that mean? Unrestrained carousing, carrying on. And then it says, and the like. In other words, this is not an exhaustive list of all the kinds of sins there are. But Paul, in his letter, is trying to warn against some of the things which obviously belong to the sinful nature. And then he concludes with another warning in which he says, Galatians 5, the last part of verse 21, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Wow. Now that doesn't mean that if you have indulged in those things, or if you have slipped into those things from time to time, that you can't be forgiven. You obviously can't. It does not mean that because you as a Christian do something wrong that you've lost your salvation. It doesn't mean that. But when, as a matter of lifestyle and without repentance, you continue in that way, you're on a dangerous, slippery slope, and you really have to question whether you know Jesus as Lord at all. Thank goodness Paul provides us with a second list, and I like this list a whole lot better. This is a great list. It's a list of lovely things. Lovely things, which he refers to as the fruit of the Spirit. And they're laid out for us in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and first part of 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now that's a fine list. The Bible word for this kind of love is agape. God-inspired love. Love which seeks the best for the other person all the time. And when you love like that, what comes along with it? Joy. Some people make a big distinction between joy and happiness. I will simply say that joy is the kind of happiness that is the result of a love relationship with God. Peace. Wow. How we need peace in our time. I was reading somewhere that the number of people diagnosed for anxiety is ten times higher now than it was just a generation ago. Ten times as many people suffering from anxiety instead of having peace. Peace is tranquility of heart that results from trusting in the character of God. If you really believe that God is a good, good Father, that He wants the best for you, that He loves you no matter what life brings your way, that brings a tremendous inner peace. The peace of God results from a love relationship with the God of peace. And then it talks about patience. We've all heard that, uh, that very common prayer, God, give me patience, please hurry up. Um, the word patience, as it is used here, is not so much a patience with events. I wish things would happen faster. It's really a reference to patience with other people. How quickly do you become impatient with other persons? Members of your family, maybe. Your friends. People around you. The government, for crying out loud. Right? <laughs> One of my dear friends from Edmonton just sent me an email that says, there is no problem in the world so serious that the government can't make it worse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, that's, uh, I don't think that's exactly what I'm talking about here. Uh, kindness, kindness. Kindness is sweetness of character. 
We should become sweeter as the years go by. I uh, heard Doug Sider, our denominational executive director, say that it's a problem if you're not sweeter at 40 than you were at 30. And you ought to be sweeter at 50 than you were at 40. And sweeter at 60 than you were at 50. And sweeter at 70 than you were at 60. And sweeter at 80 than you were at 70. And so if you're growing in the direction of becoming an old curmudgeon or an angry person, wow, turn that around. Turn that around. With God's help, by His Spirit within you. Kindness means sweetness of character. And then, goodness. Goodness is closely related to kindness, but it implies an inner strength to stand for what is right. Like Jesus, when he cleared the temple because it was being misused. That was an expression of goodness. Faithfulness. Faithfulness is absolute trustworthiness. My wife told me, and she's told me numerous times, that she fell in love with me when she decided she could trust me. And I want very much to live up to that trust and never to let her down. Faithfulness. And that applies to every area of life. Gentleness. Gentleness really includes three things. Submission to the will of God. A teachable spirit and consideration of others. <coughs> Self-control. It has been said that when a man masters himself, he becomes fit to be a loving servant of others. And you know, this whole list, this beautiful list, this fruit of the Spirit, is all summed up by this, this little phrase. Against things like this, there is no law. Who would make a law against love, against joy, against... Peace, kindness, goodness, general self-control, and all the rest. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. When this happens, that's when you experience the reality of Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But the life which I now live in this body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. What does that mean in practical terms? It means that my hands become hands for Christ to touch through. My lips become lips for Christ to speak through. My heart becomes a heart for Christ to love through. You know, the Bible warns us that to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And chapter 5 closes with a final word of caution. It says, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. You know, don't be too quick to pat yourself on the back and say, boy, I'm, I'm sure doing a fine job. Really? We all have growing to do. And let's, let's continue on just a little further into chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 1 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him. Sometimes people who hold themselves to a high standard, or maybe don't, are all too quick to judge others when they fail. We're not to condemn. We're not to judge one another in a negative way. If someone slips, if someone falls, what are we to do? We to restore that person. And how are we to do it? It says, restore him gently. The best of us may slip and fall into sin. We are not to judge each other harshly. Rather, we are to restore one another gently. And then it says, watch yourself. Watch yourself. Or you may also 
be tempted. You know, I believe that the judgmental individual is the one most likely to fall into temptation. So let's be careful. Let's be gentle with one another, as God is with us. Let's forgive one another, as God forgives us. And when you see your brother or your sister going through a hard time, what do you do? Well, verse 2 tells us, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Let's pray. Father God, your word is so practical. It's so real. We read the Bible, and although it was written 2,000 years ago, it's talking about things that we deal with every day. This struggle between a spiritual nature and a sinful nature. We can, we can relate to that. We can, we can see the problem with living according to the sinful nature, and yet sometimes we find ourselves doing that. We thank you that forgiveness is available whenever we need it. Thank you that we can have a restored relationship with you anytime, that you're always willing and ready to restore us gently. And I pray, God, that you would make us people with gentle, loving character. People who are not judgmental, but people who are willing to restore those who have fallen. Not only to restore, but to actually help carry burdens for one another. God, I pray that this church, this family of believers, would more and more reflect the attitude of Jesus Christ in all that we do, say, and even thank. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray.